This is a video on the dependence of reaction rates on temperature. As we've seen so far, reaction rates, let's move past this slide, sorry about that. Reaction rates, the rate of a reaction as we know so far, is dependent upon the concentration in most cases. Unless it's a zero order, then we know it's not dependent upon the concentration of the reactants. But if it's first order, second order, or any other order that's not zero, we know that the rate is dependent upon the concentration. Not only does the rate depend upon the concentration, but it also depends upon the temperature. For the most part, for most reactions, as the temperature increases, so does the rate of the reaction. That's why we put things in the refrigerator, because the decomposition process, the process in which food goes bad, is really a chemical reaction or a series of chemical reactions that takes place. And we try to slow the rate of those chemical reactions down by placing the substance in the refrigerator. Or if we want to slow it down even further, we would take that substance and place it in the freezer and allow it to freeze and slow down the rate of that reaction even further. So as we can see from life experiences that there's definitely um, a relationship between temperature and the reaction rate in most cases of course. Now <clears throat> to explain that dependence uh, scientists have developed this thing called the collision theory. The collision theory basically says that the rate is directly related to the number of collisions per second. Now that's a nice idea. It's a very simple idea, but unfortunately it doesn't really tell the whole story. Because if the rate were directly related solely to the number of collisions per second, then most reactions would be fast because the molecules would collide and if there's lots and lots of molecules, especially if there, it was a gas, gaseous reactants, those molecules are moving with lots of energy and they're moving in rapid random rates and they're colliding with each other quite often. And so if the rate were just dependent upon the number of collisions per second, most reactions, especially those gaseous ones, would be instantaneous. Well, a collision must also be effective. And that's one of the things that basically affects the rate of the reaction in terms of the number of collisions per second. Just because two molecules collide doesn't mean that collision results in a reaction. And so the collision has to be effective. What makes a, a collision effective is two things. One, they must require the minimum amount of energy necessary in order for the reaction to occur. Because when the molecules collide, we've got to break the old bonds. The old bonds have to break and the new bonds have to form. When old bonds break, it requires energy. So energy has to go into breaking the bonds of the particular molecule whose bonds need to break. And therefore, those collisions have to have a minimum amount of energy in order to provide the energy to break the bonds. So the, when they collide, the molecule starts vibrating, the atoms start vibrating within the molecule, and that provides a sufficient amount of energy to begin to break the bonds. Also, the molecules have to have the correct orientation. In other words, they have to be facing each other in the correct way. And the next slide that you're going to see uh, will further explain what we mean by that. The minimum amount of energy required to initiate a chemical reaction is called the activation energy, and it is given the symbol Ea. So that's the minimum amount necessary. Certainly, the collision can have more than amount and be effective but it can't have less than the amount of e activation energy or EA to be effective. In this slide, this slide as we said is the one that's going to help us to better understand this idea of orientation. The reaction is, is that potassium, this is a reaction, potassium reacts with CH3I to form Ki and CH3. And of course, this represents the K atom and this represents a CH3I molecule. There's our carbon and our three H's and our I. Now, these two are going to collide and the bonds here are going to break between the I and the C. Those bonds are going to break and the bond between the K and the I is going to form. Notice that in this collision that the K 
and the eye are lined up so that they collide with each other. And we see that the reaction proceeds and we get the Ki and the CH3. So we have to have this orientation of those particles. They have to be in the right orientation when they collide in order for the reaction to occur. In this collision, we see that the K is here, but it's going to now collide with the CH3. So if they're not oriented properly, the reaction is not going to occur. And that's why we say, in addition to the frequency of the collision, in addition to having a sufficient amount of energy for the old bonds to begin to break, they must be oriented in the correct direction so that those species which are going to combine to form a product must collide with each other and if they don't, even if there is a sufficient amount of energy in that collision, it doesn't mean that the collision will be an effective one. Here are a couple of graphs for a particular reaction in which A plus B reacts to form this intermediate right here. This is an intermediate. It's a transition state. This is a transition state between A and B and now forms the product C and D. So if we look to the left, if we look at this graph of potential energy versus reaction progress, we see that we start out with A and B and they have a certain amount of potential energy with respect to the rest of the substances on the chart. The collision has to, that results between the two has to have a sufficient amount of energy to bring it up this air and energy barrier. In other words, the collision has to result, that results, has to have the correct amount of energy, the minimum amount of energy, the activation energy, in order for this to begin to form the intermediate, this transition step, which is known as the activated complex. That's called the activated complex. Here, at the activated complex, the bonds between A and B are beginning. So if there are any old bonds that were in, this, in these molecules before, they are breaking, but at the same time, the bonds between the new products are beginning to form. So it's a transition step. It's called the activated complex. It's, it's a transition step. It's a transition species. And again, here at the top, if we have enough energy to begin to get us over this activation energy barrier, to begin breaking the old bonds, we begin to break the old bonds, and at the same time, we form the new bonds. Now, what could happen is it could slide back down the energy barrier and become A and B again. But, of course, that wouldn't make much sense. And so it slides down the hill, down the energy hill, down towards our products and our new products form. So A and B collide. It's a sufficient amount of energy to begin to break the bonds. The old bonds begin to break. And at the same time, the new bonds are forming. And then in terms of energy, when the old bonds break and the new bonds form, energy is given off in the process in forming C and D. When the old bonds break, we need to absorb energy. When the new bonds form, they give off energy. And of course, the activation energy, A, e, A, is the minimum amount of energy required to initiate this reaction. This reaction is considered to be exothermic. You can look at it in two different ways. One, the reactants have more potential energy than the products. So in order for the products to have less potential energy than the reactants, energy had to be given off. We can also look at it like this. It takes less energy to break the old bonds than is released when the new bonds form. And so, if we took the difference between the potential energy of A plus B and the potential energy of C plus D, what we would get is the delta H for the reaction. So the difference in those energies is the delta H. Over here on the other graph, we have potential energy versus reaction progress again, but instead this process is endothermic. And so the reactants have less energy than the products, and the activation energy is going to be much bigger. But again, as they collide, if a sufficient amount of energy, if the minimum amount of energy for this reaction to occur happens with, between the two molecules in this particular collision, they will climb this energy barrier for which they will produce the activated complex, this transition step, 
or in which A and B are the old bonds are breaking between A's and B's and the new bonds are forming and then slide down the energy hill down to our products to form C and D. And again, if we take the difference between the energy of A plus B and the energy of C plus D, that difference between them two represents the delta H of this particular reaction. And of course that's going to be positive value. This is going to be a negative value. Because if we take final and subtract initial, we see that final is less than initial and it comes out negative. And if we take final and subtract initial, we see that final is greater than initial and that's going to come out to be positive. And again, endothermic because more energy is required to break the bonds than is released when the new bonds form. Or if you just want to look at it this way, the difference between A plus B, A, uh, I'm sorry, A plus B and C plus D, the difference between the two, A plus B is lower in energy than C plus D and therefore we have to give it energy in order for that to occur. Temperature dependence of the rate constant. Well, it turns out, my friends, that the reason temperature affects the rate of a reaction is because it affects the rate constant. Arrhenius came up with this equation that determined that the rate constant, K, was equal to a constant A times E to the minus EA over RT power, where EA is the activation energy, R is the gas law constant, 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin, T is the temperature in the Kelvin scale, and A is what is known as a frequency factor. It has something to do with the frequency of the collisions. So, the value of K, we can see, is related to the temperature in terms of the frequency factor times E raised to the minus EA over RT. Now, if we rearrange the equation a little bit and do a little math on it, we can get the equation to look like this. This, as you can see, is an exponential function because, remember, it's K is equal to A times E raised to the minus EA over RT power. And so the curve looks like this, and it's an exponential function. And of course, as we've said in other videos, scientists, for some reason, they don't like curves. It's easier to look at straight lines. And so by doing a little math on the Arrhenius equation, we get an equation that looks like this, where the natural log of K is equal to minus EA over R times 1 over T plus the log of A. So by plotting the log, the natural log of K versus 1 over T, we can find that we're going to get a straight line. It's a linear equation with a negative slope. Oop, let's go back for a second. Sorry about that. And so 1 over T is our x-axis. The natural log of K is our y-axis. The natural log of the frequency factor should be our y-intercept. And the slope of this line is minus E over A. Um, e A, excuse me, let's try that again. Minus E A over R. As you can see, it's a linear, right? You get a straight line. It's a linear equation with a negative slope. And one of the things that we can do with this particular curve is we can find the value of the activation energy for a particular reaction. And so, if we wanted the activation energy for a particular reaction, if we could determine the value of K at various temperatures, we make a plot of the natural log of K versus 1 over T. And when we see that plot, we notice that it's a straight line. We take the slope of that line, and the slope of that line represents minus EA over R. So all we would have to do is multiply the slope times R, and we would get the, act the negative of the activation energy. We're going to take the Arrhenius equation because in the form that we just showed you before, mathematically speaking, it's good for making that plot and trying to find the value of EA by, from the slope, but it's really not all that great in terms of problem solving. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take the Arrhenius equation in the form that we just showed you, and we're going to establish the equation in terms of T1 and T2.
So we establish the equation in terms of a substance, right? Or not a substance, excuse me, a reaction that is occurring at temperature T1, where the value of K, the rate law constant, is K1. And then change the, con the temperature at which this reaction is occurring. And the value of K becomes K2. If we take the two equations and we divide it out, we get an equation that looks like this. It looks kind of similar to the Clausius and Clapeyron equation. And I got to tell you something, I found a little mistake here. So let me stop for a second. And I'm going to fix it. So let's fix it. Let's get this negative sign out of here. It doesn't belong there. And then we'll get back to the show. Okay, so hopefully we're back. So we can see that the natural log of K1 over K2 is equal to Ea or R times T1 minus T2 divided by T1 times T2. And of course, we can use that equation for solving problems, which we'll do examples of in class. All right, so this ends this video and we'll move on to another video.